All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Before we kind of get going on the podcast, just want to give a quick shout out to Anchor. Anchor is the quickest and easiest way to make a podcast. It's going to help you, you know, create a podcast from your phone or your computer. Then it's going to give you the option to, you know, distribute your podcast almost anywhere, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So why don't you go ahead? Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. All right, let's go. I want Hilary Swank in the next Terminator movie so bad. There is nothing in this world that you give me to do to hug a robot. It's because it's so incredible and intricate that it's impossible not to notice. Music's the core of this movie. Born again to watch (laughs) this movie. You'll find redeeming things and you'll be thinking about it for a long time afterwards. There was no bone saw. Just John hamming it up over here. Two and a half out of three of us recommend it. <laughs> Everybody loves talking about movies. Let's talk about movies. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in once again to the Pause, Rewind, Play podcast. At least this time and this week, I called it the Pause, Rewind, Play podcast. Last week, I said the Pause, Rewind podcast. Just in case anyone was wondering, I knew about that. And I thought about during like the editing, like just putting in the rest of it. I was like, no, I want someone to call me out on like <laughs> Twitter or Instagram. And none of you did, and I feel kind of sad about it. But anyhow, we're back again this week for another great episode. We're going to be talking It too. but first off, we have our main cast, as always, with us. First off, I'm Casey. Next, we have... Vince. I'm here. <laughs> I pointed at you as my right invisible arm, actually. I realized oh. I just, like, leaned oh. it forward. I didn't say sorry. <laughs> I'm, Mike, Michael's here. Yeah, I did miss that joke last week about you being Georgie, so oh. I don't see that you only have one arm. I don't oh, see that kind of stuff. Good for guys. you, man. Yeah. Good for you. Hats off to you for Thank not you. seeing <laughs> arms. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our third and final cast member. Josh. Beep, beep, guys. What's up? Do we all have a good week this week? Yeah, yeah it was great. It was Very actually good. Vince's birthday the other day. It hey, was my birthday whoop. yesterday. Yeah. Turned 32. Went and did the Timpanogos Cave, Timpanogos Cave Tour, barbecued, and then went to It Chapter 2 last night. It was a good did day. They, did they give you a walker for the cave? <laughs> <laughs> I could have used it. I had two sticks going up uh, the thing. Yeah. <laughs> the two ski poles. It's been it was a, good. It was a good weekend. Nice. So happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to you, Vince. <laughs> Anyhow, happy birthday again, Vince, and uh, congratulations to another year on planet Earth. Thank you. All right, pretty quick here. Josh, what did you watch in the last week? Anything good? Literally nothing besides this. I've just been doing a lot with work, new job, and also school started up for me. So I saw it chapter two, and that was it. I mean, I've been watching just tons of stuff on Netflix. Like, I'm sort of all over the place looking for what I'm going to watch next. So I've been watching, like... Did you start a Dark Crystal yet? No, I didn't start the Dark Crystal yet, Vince. I got to invest in that. Yeah. I've also been listening to a new audiobook so that instead of like watching stuff sometimes i'll do chores around the house and listen to that um i've been watching walking dead season nine because they threw it on netflix it's just not the same all right and uh vince what have you been watching this week one episode left of dark crystal go check it out it's worth every minute it consistently gets better throughout all 10 episodes and i'm loving it and it's absolutely great also my wife made me watch dante's peak Talked a lot of crap for years and years, saying I didn't want to watch Dante's Peak with her. It's a great movie. Watch Dante's Peak. Wait, is that the one with the guy who plays James Bond and uh-huh. the, the lava and the grandma gets in the boiling water? Yes. Okay. But not you only on not only does it star Pierce Brosnan, but also Sarah Connor is in this movie. Whoa. Oh. Yeah. So it's it's good. I don't remember it being as good as it was, and she kept trying to convince me and trying to convince me. Finally, we did it. It was great. She also made me watch Twister. It was not great. <laughs> oh, come on. I Twister's great. Wait, the I don't aluminum like can what? things? Is that, is that right? They have the aluminum so cans good. in the back of their yeah. truck? If you get yeah. half the Shining in that movie, it's like two movies in one. <laughs> it's like a double double kill, yeah. movie-wise. Man. So, speaking of like Dante's Peak, I'm, I kid you not, I had nightmares for years about that movie because I was like not very old, and my dad's like, this isn't scary. And I just watched it with him. I was too young to have watched that movie. And I remember every time we would go by, like, 
like a mountain where it looked oh, like yeah. there was a volcano, I would think like someone's crazy. It scared me too when I was a kid. I remember yeah. being scared of tornadoes for a long time. But and so I, when I rewatched this one, I expected it to be more scary than it was, and I just I just didn't work for me anymore. I was just kind of bored. Yeah. So, huh. what are you gonna do? What do you do, Michael? What about you? Anything good? Uh, I watched the entire third season of Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix. Oh, I thought we were back to Boy Meets World again. No, well, I could. Don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Wait, I don't know what Hip Hop so Evolution. So it's just this show. It's uh, it's about they go through and tell you like chronologically from the beginning of the roots of hip hop all the way up to season three. The last episode's like. They're right there in the mid '90s, about like Tupac and Biggie, and they like kind of go through each section, of like East versus West, and all oh, the cool. South and stuff. Yeah, uh, I used to listen to a lot of rap when I was younger, and it's still there. Like my interest is still there. So when I see it pop up, I'm like, oh yeah, let's do this. And there's only four episodes this, a season, yeah. so it's pretty easy. That's to a get really. There. Did it get into like the uh, Tupac death and everything? There, yeah, you said Tupac and yeah. Biggie's murder. Season three, it starts with that. Yeah, that's an interesting story. It's crazy. Go back and watch all that kind of he's stuff. He's still crazy. alive, Tupac. Yeah, that's what they say. He's he's hiding out somewhere. Puerto Rico, yeah. Oh, I don't know what happened there. No, that's, uh, that's super great. cool. I I like hip hop, and I think that there's like a really fascinating history there. So it really, it's really, really, really good. They get into like all the underground, like next to all the mainstream stuff, and they tell you it's really good. It, and like I said, I'm going backwards in music lately. I've been like downloading Outcast and the Tribe Called mm-hmm. Quest, and everyone's going forward, and I'm going back towards like early '90s and. It's a good time. I got here, really here. into to Biggie for a little while. Cool. Um, I think it was like right after Straight Outta Compton. And okay, I, was, I saw the movie. I was like, this is so good. And I missed all of that growing up. I never listened to any of that kind of stuff. I was into the more emo screamo all yeah. growing up, you know? So I put that on, discovered Biggie, and I was just like, this is good That's 90s so cool. hip hop. Okay. 90s? Is that yeah, 90s? I'm going to yeah. send you so much music. You, this is going to be great. Speaker Box and the Love to Low is below is like one of my favorite albums cool. of all time That's just awesome. just so you know so good we're talking hip-hop i felt yep. compelled to say awesome. that i really guys going back to what i watched this week i watched this movie i watched a lot of new girl with my wife we watched the haunting of hill house we're almost finished with it. we're still like getting into it the thing is re-watching that series i just want to call this out watch it the first time be totally freaked out and get the story watch it the second time be freaked out but see more details that's how I feel about this. So watch The Haunting of Hill House. That is my, my movie tip of the week. Watch that series. Love it. Lust it. Enjoy it. All of it. It's great. It's so good. That's so good. <laughs> I think, Go I think I'm going to do that. Just like because I mentioned before how I hadn't seen it yet. Now that I'm yeah. sort of like scrambling, watching a ton of stuff, seeing what I want to watch next, I think we're getting I'm, to spooky time, yeah, guys. Yeah, so. right around the corner. <laughs> when I mean, you still have... goblins find the door, yeah. ring the bell on your front door. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm sorry. No, uh, the haunting on. Wait, what is it? Haunting, haunting on, of Hill House. Thank you. There's too many words. Um, it has one of the best scares. Yeah. In all. I know exactly which one. Everybody, about. yeah. Everyone, yeah. everyone I know knows that, exactly which one it is. I know someone told me about it once, but thank goodness I don't remember it because Good. even though I hate it, it's always nice to have it. Hey, scared. just make I, sure you watch this with your wife, Josh. Please no, do. No, she won't watch it with me. I know she won't. She barely. I literally had to drag her to watch It Chapter 2 with me. <laughs> It was bad. Oh, but sorry. I just always want Jaleesa to watch a scary movie. I want, I want a Jaleesa episode on scary movies. To be honest with you, a Jaleesa episode on scary movies would have very many plot holes. Because <laughs> here's a funny story. I kid you not. We went to watch it chapter two, and she went with me because she loves me, and it was date night, and you know I'd been at work all day. So she went with me. She took you know like a blanket and a pillow thinking that she was going to sleep. She couldn't sleep, but she also, without telling me, packed along one of those little, like, uh, masks that they give you on the airplane. Oh, my god! <laughs> and so anytime she knew that a jump scare was coming, she would just whoosh, That's <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> she is the hero that. we need. Actually, <laughs> speaking of it, right? So I was working a couple years ago in an event. I think it was in Kansas City, and after the event, we're like, we're not tired yet, and it's 11 o'clock at night. Let's go watch it. Okay, the theater's pretty much empty, which is great. But there is a grandma and her like seven-year-old grandchild in there, and no. the grandma was like casually just putting her hand over the kid's <laughs> eyes, right? But like, think about it: the sound going in there, and this little kid is like squealing, and one of my coworkers like sits up and looks over, and is like, 
is that really a kid in here? Like, oh, what the hell? Yeah, what the heck? Yeah, so just just a random fact. Like, Jaleesa's not alone. Little kids go there, too, and they get freaked out. But, no. I don't know. Let's, uh, let's kind of get into this movie now, guys. Uh, I think we need to give a little bit of the details. Oh, real quick. Oh, before yeah. we uh, move forward from what to watch, uh, remember to watch Dark Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we can move on now. <laughs> I just choked on my drink, okay? <laughs> I'm glad that you brought it up again. But um, who's got some details on the movie? Who wants to kind of talk that? I got him. Perfect. Okay, so It Chapter 2, directed once again by Andy Muschietti, written by Gary uh, Gary Dob- Doberman, who was a writer on the previous movie, um, released September 6th, 2019, with a budget of $35 million. Um, so far, the movie's been out one weekend now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has already grossed $91 million domestic and $94 million overseas. Wow. So it's made it. Over $180 million? Dang. Yeah. Oh, Dang. It's, it hasn't beaten it chapter one's record, but it's one. Of, it's like up there again with, for one of the highest grossing rated R movies and highest grossing horror movies. And they only made it for $35 million. According to IMDb, again, you might want to check my, my numbers, but that's what I found when I was looking through. You might want to check my number on that. <laughs> you that sounds, that it sounds pretty low, but if it is, that's like it's, the, it's double. Film. I remember reading it was double the budget of the first one, so they had a lot more to work with this time around. Mm-hmm. Um, Rotten Tomatoes: the critic sto- score is sixty-four percent, and the audience score is eighty percent, and the IMDb, bo- IMDb score is seven point two. Um, the movie is starring all the kids from It Chapter One. If you want to look them up, you're more than Welcome to. It is also starring James McAvoy as Bill, Bill Hader as Richie, Jessica Chastain as Beverly, Jay Ryan as Ben, Isaiah Mustafa as Mike, James Ransom as Eddie, Ranson, sorry, James Ranson as Eddie, and Andy Bean as Stanley. Guys, do you know that the guy who plays adult Mike is also the old Spice Man? It's like... Really? No. Ladies, look at your man. No now way. Now back to me. I'm I, riding a horse. I didn't believe it until he showed me it in a video. Really? Before yeah. we started this. That is mind-blowing. Yeah, that's just cool. know that that's who that is. So cool. when I watched it, halfway through, I was like, I've normally seen this man shirtless. That was my thoughts throughout this whole thing. I was like, what a weird thing huh. to be like, shirtless man playing Mike. Mm-hmm. So Do you even recognize him? I bet he smells fresh the whole time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any last kind of... Non spoiler material before we jump into this? Mm, I don't no? think so. Nope. Okay. Guys, ready. There, there are going to be spoilers going forward, everyone. So if you haven't seen the movie, please go check it out in theaters. I personally think it's one worth going and seeing, at least, just so you can kind of get that full circle of the It franchise here. But let's kind of go forward. And I have like one question to kind of kick this movie off. And I'm curious what you guys are going to think about it. Was this a horror film? Yes. Yeah, it was. But. It wasn't a very scary horror film at times. Yeah, it was a horror film, but it was undercut by its own humor. So when <sighs> when I, the reason I bring this up, right, is because my wife actually, I asked her today, I was like, so what did you think of it? She said the first thing she said was it was funny. And I was like, that's not what it's supposed to be, right? That's not, that's how I felt too when I left the theater. I was like, that was a funny movie. It's like... I didn't feel as scared in this one as I did in the other one, which is kind of weird. Maybe it's because it was more based around children in the other one, right? And, like, I remember being a child and facing my fears of Dante's Peak burning Inferno Lava Grandma, right? Yeah. And now it's just like, oh, man, these are adults like me, and the real world is pretty freaking scary. I don't know. What do you guys think about that, like, when we're talking this? Like, because you're right, Michael. It was overshadowed in horror by its own comedy. I think to throw my two cents in that, while it is at many times uh, plagued with a lot of humor. I think that the humor both adds a lot to the movie as Hold well on, as... Sorry, random uh, interruption right there. I know. Uh, but there's an armed robbery down the street from my house, and my wife just messaged me and just said, hey, something's going on. I jumped up, went outside... And apparently there was an armed robbery at a grocery store down the street from me. And apparently somewhere down my street, the police have surrounded a home yeah. and are going to get this guy. <laughs> so exciting night for us here. 
but Home so, Invasion movie right here. <laughs> we're watching the wrong movie. We're talking yeah. the wrong movie tonight. But uh, Josh, what kind of what were you thinking about, like with your two cents on this being like a comedy versus a horror? Yeah, where were you? Uh, just really quick, I guess, to throw it into a quick little bow. I think that there is a lot of humor in this movie, and obviously, it's very hilarious. Bill Hader is just incredible with his humor. And while a lot of people say that it detracts from the movie, I say that it doesn't do, it doesn't take away enough, like, so that it doesn't make it a horror movie. I think that it adds a lot to it. And yeah, while maybe we could do with a little more, like, suspense and action and stuff like that, I think it was perfectly fine and it gave us an enjoyable experience all the way through. So I can agree with that. I'd agree with that too. And and going off of, like, the first uh, movie. Like, it's an exploration of, like, innocence and childhood. And it is a very fun um, reminder of, of what it was like to spend your summers with all your buddies down by the river. And I kind of feel like this, in a way, was kind of trying to go off of that tone from the first movie and continue on into this one. So, uh, for example, like, it's a movie about getting back together with all your buddies from high school that you haven't seen in years and years and years. And it they take off as if they had never left you know i mean they couldn't they couldn't remember specific things but as it was coming back their their memories of who they were when they were in middle school started returning and they started treating each other like they did back in high school richie and eddie kind of like making fun of each other all the time and giving each other crap and that's kind of what the book is too like it stephen king's it is a horror novel but it's also that exploration of humanity and friendship. And I feel like they were trying to strike a balance with the humor and the horror, but the horror was really far and in between at points and then really like culminated at the end, I felt like. It's very much both the book as well as the movie are very much character pieces. And that's why you have especially so many people in the Losers Club. You have like seven people and each one of them has their own story that through their fears and everything is resolved or at least looked at. So while it is a horror movie, it's very much, like you said, it's a character piece. It's an exploration of friendship and humanity and individual fears. So I don't know. One way or another, even if we there was some big thing and we came to consensus that it wasn't a horror movie, I liked it. So Yeah. yeah. Um, with that, with you saying that it's an individual and all the for a character piece and stuff that's that is where i have my my biggest hiccup with the whole movie is i wanted more character into the adults they turned into rather than set piece scare set piece scare set piece scare i wanted more of who they were Mm -hmm. and who they have turned into because of these past traumas and that's the only issue well not the only issue i had with the movie um I enjoyed the movie, but those things for me were too glaring mm-hmm. to to think it was like a modern classic. Yeah, I agree. And you started to ex- expect it where it's like they get together. You have this great scene in the Chinese restaurant, which I want to get into in a little bit. It's probably my favorite part of the whole movie. And then all of a sudden they all kind of like separate. And that's not what I wanted. Like like I said, what made the first one special was their interactions with each other and watching their relationships and how they they joked around and everything. And all of a sudden in the movie, they all go their separate directions and you get the same formula over and over yes. and over again. Character piece and then the scare. Character piece and then the scare. And by the like third one, you're just like, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen. And I think that's one of the things that kind of made it less scary for me mm-hmm. is because I knew what was going to come up every time. And it kind of lulled for me right there in the middle. It's like, okay, let's get through this. Let's get everyone in their tokens, and let's get them back together and move on with the story. So with that being said, like those slow parts, did you feel that the cut and chop – I feel – so I'm using this as like a choppy nature, right, of the film, like getting these tokens and when they separate, right? Did you feel that that created like a lull in the middle that couldn't – the film you felt didn't recover from? I think it did recover from it. Yeah. I think so too. But it did definitely slow down. When they got back together, that's when it started picking up and that's when it got scary to me. Yeah. Also, I think I think the the reason it lulled is because all of their tokens except Richie's, I think, um we all knew about. 
like mm-hmm. uh, Bev's postcard. We we knew about that. That didn't like push anything forward. Um, Ben's uh, yearbook. yearbook page. We all we all knew it, um, with the exception of Richie's with with the token from the arcade where he has like uh, like feelings for a boy. Where you didn't know that in the first one, but this is like a, a progression forward for that character. Mm-hmm. That was interesting and what I was expecting out of this movie where all of the, each of their tokens was like, okay. And I understand that they were, had forgotten all of it, but for us, like we'd seen it. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's why this, I, I keep going back and forth because I liked that. I liked that we got to see more content pulled directly from the novel. I loved that we got to see, the big uh, statue come to life and go after Richie. I love that they included their their hideout in the in the ground. I loved seeing those things, but I kind of made I, f- I feel like it kind of made the first one a little bit pointless. I feel like both movies can stand on their own as their own movie. You mm-hmm. know, the first one they overcome their problem and they stop the monster and the monster disappears. That could be the end of the story. And then this one, there was so many flashbacks to when they were kids. And I'm just like, well, what was the point in even showing what happened when they were kids, when you're just going to retread this, this exact same steps over again, show the same stuff over again. I felt the same way. And I was kind of disappointed. I know this is like more of like a humorous reference in a way too, but I was hoping that they would be more like Scooby-Doo and the gang, like going around and getting each other's tokens, right? And experiencing those together. I think that that would have been really constructive and really made it so we felt the same feeling, right? As in the first film. But with this one where they're out on their own, right? They're having their own personal experiences because, right, they obviously weren't together during that period of time where they have all these experiences. But why not take your friends on that journey in a way and, like, explain it to us? Because you as an adult, right, like, when they left Derry, they forgot a lot of things. The only one who didn't was Mike. And the rest of them had forgotten everything. And why not have them all together? And then as you're remembering, re-experiencing that together. And I thought, I think that would have really added to this film. Whereas for me, this was, this was just kind of a flat hole for me. And it really made this film feel like it was three hours long, where the other one, I never felt that it was a long film. Yeah. So so something, at least, that I can put in for a positive note for those sections, because I am in complete agreement. I even have, like, in the notes I took, like, that was the one part of the movie I didn't like, was that during that middle part, it was so predictable, because like Ben said, it was the same equation every single time. Like for all of the people. So something that I can put as a positive note for this was that they is, I liked how it mirrored the first one, how they all had their individual experience. And the first one, it was, you know, specifically with Pennywise and with their fears. And the second one, it was also about their fears, but it was while they got their tokens. So I liked seeing that mirrored part in the second one. And I think that maybe if they still wanted to do it as, Hey, it needs to be an individual thing, then maybe they could have done it a little bit more like they did in the first one where they all have those experience, but it's spaced out in the movie yeah. and change it up a little bit because it was so predictable where it was, like I mentioned before, where my wife had the little airplane thing that she would pull over her eyes. Oh. I mean, she knew exactly when it was coming every single time. Yeah. Like it was super predictable. And also the fact that every single one of them, you know, we all knew it was going to end in a scare, but the fact that so many of them were just like straight jump scares and stuff like that, yeah. that was something where I felt like um, sort of like we talked about in our very first episode, Brightburn, jump scares can be a good thing, but if you rely too heavily on them, it makes the movie feel cheap. Yeah. It makes you, you're falling back on like that jump scare horror film. And so you're not, if you're going to rely on that, it's not going to be like a progressive horror film, mm-hmm. you know, like a new age one. But so I still feel like it was the new age, but I, I didn't like how and, much they relied on yeah. jump scares. Yeah, we got a taste of what it could be. Because yeah. like, like you said, um, those jump scares are, are cheap and they're kind of throwaway. But it's those moments like the old lady in Bev's uh, old house. Those are the stuff that stays with you. When she's walking around, she's exploring the house, and you see in the background this little old lady like, strip down naked and just like walk across the in the background and it's not focused on her it's just something that happens in the background and it's the most like jarring like confusing terrifying moment but it's something so small and it's something that stands out so so strongly in my mind 
I, I keep going back to the first movie, but something that we didn't talk about that my wife got real mad at me because she loves <laughs> this part. It's her favorite part about It Chapter One, and this pertains to the same idea. In the library in It Chapter One, when Ben is studying about dairy, you see in the background the librarian will come over and hand him the book. And as he's looking through the book, you see it's like the camera's looking at his face, and you see over his shoulder the librarian walk up behind him and just turn and it's it's out of focus so you just kind of see her body but she just turns and stares at him that entire time and it's the most like weird unsettling unsettling thing i didn't know that yeah it's pennywise that that. He, pennywise becomes the librarian and just stares at him through that whole scene in the background and if it's like you're talking about haunted the hill house if you're not paying attention you're not gonna notice it and at all we talk about this every time we watch a horror movie. That's what makes a great horror movie is the rewatching mm. and seeing these weird things happening in the background that you never noticed in the first place. That's what makes a good horror movie. A lot of these, especially in this one, moments in the first one, like the flute lady that was completely CGI, a lot of the jump scares in this one were CGI monsters. And I think that's, Michael, you asked us, because we saw it together, you asked me when we left, like, did you feel like it was this one was scarier than the first one? And me and my wife were both just like, I don't think so. I thought the first one was scarier. I think after like rolling it over my head over and over today, like why didn't I think this one was scarier? I think it's because those cheap thrills just didn't stand out. And a lot of the time there were CGI characters or cheap camera CGI effects that I thought were corny. Like what was scary about the, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot, but what was scary about the little old lady was seeing her do those weird things. As soon as she became that CGI awkward naked lady monster it was laughable like it wasn't scary to me anymore it was just kind of like like pennywise didn't know what he was doing after 27 years of preparation <laughs> yeah he no uh, pennywise might have with that specific topic of him not knowing like maybe he doesn't really know how to scare adults um with that scene uh that's the only one that really stuck with me. Like you said, the, the old lady being in the background, being creepy, being weird. And when she came out, that big CGI, I that was the scariest moment for me in the movie because I wasn't prepared for it. I, that's the one I didn't notice the CGI. Like, oh, really? Because I, I was so did. invested in the old lady, like her movements and how long that scene lasted. That's That one for me was like, the jarred me. It totally jarred me out of like, just I was so I was scared. I was startled mm-hmm. with that one, but all the other ones were were predictable. And not to say they weren't beautiful. All of them were done really, really well. Um, but like Josh said, uh, it's just so predictable. It was hard to be scared by. So Beverly was one of the first if not the first one right so number one you hadn't really already gotten into that rhythm right and for me i guess i was just more jarred by like it was laughable and i had some teenagers sitting next to me and my wife who while most of the time they were annoying it sort of pointed out to me sometimes how laughable at times it could be at that moment where it was that lady you know this kid next to me laughed and i was sort of annoyed but i was like i also get it like i understand um but for me, it was a little bit jarring, sort of like you said, I was taken aback because we had that part in one of the trailers, right? Except you didn't see the monster. And so I thought it really was just going to be, you know, the naked old lady running at her, like doing something crazy, or maybe she would shake really fast or something. Mm-hmm. And so then when that monster came, I was like, what the, that's <laughs> like, exactly. I was not expecting yeah, that's that. that's exactly how I And so it, it definitely took me aback. And so, but I also, I also grew with Vince where that one I did, even though I was taken aback, I was pretty aware of the CGI and I thought it was pretty poor a lot of times. Well, 35 million for CGI is not a lot, especially yeah. when you have those the caliber of actors yeah. in that movie. I would imagine their budget or their pay, their salaries were Yeah, it's got to be high. Great. Yeah, you know. And and don't get me wrong, like the CGI can be used right. Like for I'm going to go back again to the Chinese restaurant. Like when the fortune cookies started opening up and the weird like little monsters started crawling out and it's just like this creepy little monsters like that was really really cool and that worked really well for me it was just the 
I don't know, the big stuff that, that just... Once know, it ballooned, it, it became cheesy in my mind. Yeah. Once it once it felt bloated at that point, it was kind of like, right, like we talked about food earlier, right, where you're like, I'm just going to eat enough, right? Like they just took it just one size too big, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, ah, nah, that's how I felt about it. So let's kind of like <laughs> hop into this actual scene Sorry. right here that we want to talk about. I oh. just wanted to point out that was a nice pun. Once it ballooned. <laughs> 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 Sorry, keep going. My bad. Because that's how I felt. I was like, I oh, know I got it. And then Josh got it. Thank you. Um, but really, friends get back together, right? And they show back up in their hometown because something is happening, right? And we see it the first. This is probably the most jarring part of the movie to me, actually, is they're at the fairground. These two guys, right? They're wandering around the fairground. And then they get brutally assaulted and murdered. And that murder is actually based off of a real murder that happened on the East Coast, just so you guys know, which is crazy. But essentially, this is where everything starts. You see the balloons, right? You see Pennywise. You experience it. And Mike, he's just part of the town, and he's stayed at the town, right? And he jumps back into it. And this is the sign that tells him, get the Loser Club back together and get them here. And then they meet up in the Chinese restaurant. But, like, do you think, like, really the part of getting the club back together, the group... How difficult do you think that would be? Like, really, you get a phone call from a guy you've practically forgotten about a town you've practically forgotten, an experience that you've most definitely walled up in your mind. Would you go back to Derry? I think it would be really hard, but I think that the reason that it all happened was because even though they don't remember it, this the moment they got that phone call and something happened, they felt something within them, right? And that's like sort of the whole point is even if they don't remember it, they remember that something's there that they don't remember. And even though they don't remember, they know it's big and they know that they got to go back. Yeah. They say that in the film, they feel that fear and they couldn't explain it until Mike kind of tells them like, yeah, this all happened. Um, with that, would you guys go back? If you got a phone call, (laughs) I'd go back because right. Like there's a weird feeling. I don't know if you've ever had this. Like there's a weird feeling when somebody says something right. And you like, can't remember it, but you're drawn to it. And, like, whether it's in a group discussion like this, it's, like, deja vu almost, right? Yeah. And I'm when I have deja vu, I'm led to try and get as close to that experience that I've allegedly had in my mind where there was a glitch in the Matrix, and I go for that, right? But I would probably go back, but I would be very hesitant. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think about it, like, if my really good friends from high school called me, who I still keep in real, like, pretty good contact nowadays like if tim or kent shout out to you guys if you ever listen to this like if any either of you guys called me up and were like dude it's happening again and all of a sudden something clicked in my mind and i knew you guys were going back to put yourself in danger and i wasn't going to be there to like back you up i would have a problem with that i don't know if i'd be able to live with that you know so i want to say yes but i'm not in that situation of pure terror i mean that whole sequence was done so so well it shows exactly where those guys each each character is at in their life shows how they've grown up how they've forgotten about everything where they at whether they're happy or not with what's going on and they just get this call and immediately panic and have to figure out what they're going to do and i I try to put myself in that situation if i mean richie just immediately runs outside and pukes everywhere And then there's a comedic joke after it, you know, it's like, I puked, you know, and it's really funny. But like, I think that's like probably my reaction. If I had to go back to the town to fight the thing that almost killed me, that takes the form of my worst fear, that'd be a really hard decision to go back and do. But I want to think that I would. I don't know. Do you think you'd have the... I I think my my curiosity would take over and I would absolutely go back, but... The curiosity of why you felt that way? Yeah, why I felt that way, right? I like, I need to know why I felt that way. And I'd go back and I would probably die. But (laughs) I would absolutely go back just on that merit alone. Like, I don't know, like, I'm not in that situation, like you said. So, like, the, the crippling fear, I don't know if I've ever had crippling fear before like they have. Yeah. To the point where you're vomiting or you... Or Stanley. Yeah, you can like kill he yourself. Just knew he couldn't take it, right? Yeah, yeah. no, that was that was a big point. Well, and he sets, yeah, he sets like a huge precedent. Like, 
and and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but where you can tell like throughout the whole first film, right? Stanley is the hesitant one. He's more hesitant than the guy who's afraid of everything, like germs and Eddie. sickness and all that, Eddie. But here's like my thing is like Beverly, right? Her character, this is the craziest part because she gets off the phone with Mike, right? And she's like, I'm going. And she just starts packing up. And this husband comes down, this very abusive husband, and just starts like, yeah, I don't well, know how to describe it, you know? And she still thing. goes. Yeah. That's good. The first thing he says, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. No, it's but good. He alludes to being, I thought he was a great husband for a second. And he's yeah. like, you know, you don't have to ask. Mm-hmm. And then immediately switches over. And I wasn't ready for that. I haven't read the novel, if you guys haven't noticed. <laughs> but uh, I do not let a novel ruin a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just read Harry Potter like last year. <laughs> No, but no, I wasn't ready for that. Like, I guess I should have saw that coming because she's in a cycle of abuse. Um, but that was jarring for me was seeing her husband switch. Yeah. And I, I wasn't ready for that. All of the characters kind of have that same moment. Like, Bev with her abusive husband is similar to her abusive father. Um, ben, who is kind of a loner growing up all through school. He's the fat kid, always got made fun of, always the new kid. He is sitting in, instead of being in the same room with all of his fellow architects, he's on Facebook, sitting all alone in his fancy apartment, who knows how far away. Um, And then there's uh, uh, Eddie, who's a hypochondriac with an overbearing mother. Overbearing, overweight mother ends up marrying an overbearing, overweight woman who kind of... Fun fact, that... His wife in the second movie, same actress as his mother in oh, the first what? movie. Whoa, yeah. that is great. It's crazy. <laughs> no, yeah, I literally, I saw that and I was like, no, they did it. That's I was crazy. like, that's so cool because they wanted him to be the same person. And while they changed it up and like made her hair different and stuff, same actress. Yeah. Uh, also, they, they did make a change from the, the books. In the movie, he says he's a risk analyst. In the book, he is a limousine driver for celebrities. So they tweaked his character. Also, Richie's character, uh, not character, they, treat, they tweaked his career and uh, made it more modern. Also, Richie becomes a stand-up comedian. He, is, uh, he does voices and stuff on the radio, I think, in the, in the book. Mm. So that, it's still like true to the character, just modernized. It's kind of cool. I was pretty upset that they didn't just call it an actuary, but then I understood why, because like, no one knows what that is. So... That's what a risk analyst basically oh, yeah. is. So like when he was All describing his job, I was like, oh, that's what I was going to be for a while. Like that's oh, what wow. I was majoring in college. And I'm like, I'm like, why didn't they just say actuary? I'm like, oh, because no one knows what that because is. Because before I started to do it, I didn't know what an actuary was. <laughs> so I'm like, fine, I get it, I yeah. guess. That's, so. that's very crazy. Especially, but, it's sorry. Like, sorry, you go. I, sorry, one more thing. I just want to shout out the way that they intertwined all these scenes together. The transitions that the director or editor, whoever it was, used to set up all of what happened over the 27 years and getting them back to Derry all in the space of like 10 or 15 minutes was so cool the way they transitioned things. It went from like one thing happening to down a sewer drain where the sewer starts to pour out and all of a sudden Henry Bowers pours out into the water 27 years ago, which transitions like up into the sky into someone else's moment and everybody's that whole story, it was just so smoothly done. And I think that's what made the middle section kind of stand out a little bit more is because everything was flowing so well together. We have this awesome, awesome scene in the Chinese restaurant. And then it's like, hard cut, this person, tell yeah. their story. Hard cut, this person, tell their story. And then it wraps up doing those same transitions again of the writing in the sky turns into Bill's keyboard or laptop computer to da 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 kind of felt different weird yeah act one was definitely that's the way i wanted the whole movie to go and right after that chinese restaurant was very the hard cut and whoa okay so this is the way it's going to be um with the very first scene in the movie Mm -hmm. that's that's i got two points on that um that's the way i thought the movie was gonna go like oh this is about adults for adults this is a, a very graphic, very in your face, going to be violent. And two, I, I wasn't ready for the the subject matter of the very first yeah. scene. That it was really hard to watch. Very, very hard to watch. It was the two guys that got sen- senselessly 
beaten to death for being gay. Yeah. And and I wasn't, I really didn't, up until about this morning, I didn't see the point to put them in the reason why. Like, why did you have to make them be beat to death for being gay? But it for later on, we're going to talk about it later, but it, it makes a connection. Let's jump to, into that right now. Okay, like, well, let's talk about Richie. Yeah, it story. makes yeah. a connection to Richie's character and why he left and why he doesn't want to be there. Like, n- it makes sense on why Derry is a scary place to be with people disappearing and the way that the people treat other people. But, yeah, no, there's uh, – go ahead, Vince. So first that. off, this is how the book starts is with this – fair gotcha. and this gay couple being senselessly attacked by these homophobic crappy crappy people this hate crime taking place and it's brutal and i asked you last week if that scene from the first chapter is the best opening to a movie i still think it's better but this one it took you by surprise and it is hard to watch and it is the saddest thing and it's so strong but man does it make you understand what Richie was going through in the town of Derry so do you like Richie comes his yeah. sorry go ahead you can kind of cover that well and this is the craziest part is so what we learn right is Richie kind of had he was he had a crush on essentially his whole childhood on Eddie right and that's why he treated him the way that he did and like you recognize that this like kind of like these jokes and kind of the sarcasm between the two of them is actually like flirting If you ever think about it, like boys and girls, like historically, like when you're a kid, right? They always say, oh, they pick on you because they like you type thing or they're mean to you because they like you. And you can see that kind of dynamic between there, between the two of them. This, like Michael said, I was not expecting that. And so that made, I was uncomfortable actually in Mm -hmm. the theater. And like, I didn't know how to take it nor how to react. I was like, I literally like turned to my wife. and I was like, are you serious? This is how they're starting this movie. Very like apt and good topic, right? To be aware of, right? And I hate to say it like this because this happens more than we know to people, unfortunately. And the reality of it is, is he went away to escape this type of, you know, scenario for himself and he was doing really good. And then he goes back to the town and, and all of this childhood cover-up reemerges, right? And you see this where he has a flashback where he's playing an arcade, right? And this is getting one of his tokens. And he's just being friendly to someone. I don't necessarily, like, he might have been attracted to them, right? But, like, being friendly. And I think they call him, like, don't they call him, like, like don't they call him out? Essentially, like, they call yeah. him a really terrible yeah. thing. And... Then he just like goes off and he carves his initials and uh, Eddie. Eddie's initials in the fence. And then he goes back at the end of the movie and kind of recarves those out because I thought that was a beautiful full circle in that aspect. But I can't imagine like having forgotten how terrible a place is in that regards and going back to it and trying to be okay with it, I guess, in a way. So to continue off what you said, I thought it was also really smart in the movie that they showed him doing that, carving it into the fence to show you, like, to sort of give you this segue into, oh, wow, like, someone that we really probably wouldn't have expected, like, really does feel that way. But I also thought it was smart that they showed it from the other side of the fence so you didn't know whose initials he had carved until later because otherwise that would have been really distracting the rest of the movie. You would have been looking for stuff between the two characters during the main action points of the movie so really smart move right there and also just with my uh, quick take on the very beginning they like we talk about how jarring it is and everything with the beginning uh scene about this couple being beaten they both the writers and how they filmed it as well as these actual characters they pull no punches Usually when you watch some sort of fight scene or people getting beaten up, you know, there will be camera angles and stuff. So, yeah, you see them fighting, but it's just like sort of something that we've been accustomed to watching action films and stuff. And so we'll see that all the fighting's going on, but you don't see a lot of stuff really up close and it happened. You see everything like you see like there's like a scene where it shows you the dude's face close up and you see him get like kicked in the face with no camera cuts, with no angles, nothing. And so it is so jarring so like Casey I was in the theater I was like what is happening I wasn't prepared for it like Michael said and so just having that transition into you know him getting thrown in the river and everything and then seeing Pennywise it just showed you 
like we talked about, it was a big part to show how Richie's character came into play as well as to set up Pennywise entering back into back into Derry. And I kept expecting those guys that attacked them to get their comeuppance. Like, I kind of expected them to be the ones that got attacked by Pennywise, but it wasn't. Like, the guy gets thrown in the river, Pennywise pulls him out, and then just takes a big bite out of him and finishes this is the kid off. And these three guys get away scot-free. Yeah. And it just kind of shows the hold that Pennywise has over this town. Like, I'm sure those guys are kind of crappy people, but, like, as the movie, both movies show, is, like, Pennywise has hold over this town in so many ways. He can make these adults not see things, like with the blood in Bev's bathroom. He can make Henry Bowers just go absolutely insane, kill his own father, want to kill all the losers. Like when Henry Bowers shows back up at his house and the cops are there, he's just freaking out. He's like, I'm not done yet. I got to kill them all. I got to kill them all. And he gets sent to an insane institution, right? He just has this hold over everything, even their, even their memories. Like by the end of the movie, when they finally kill it, they leave and they're like, why can we remember this now? Like, why did we forget before? And they're like, oh, it must be because Pennywise was still alive. But once they got rid of him, this entire town was kind of like this hold was lifted off of it and i don't know i just i just i just wanted them to get their comeuppance in that first scene i wanted them to be the ones who paid but you know as i kind of thought about it, i was like no i guess that kind of shows like this thing needs to be stopped and this no matter what happens no matter how scared these guys are if they don't stop it this is just going to keep happening over and over and over again well this goes into real the reality of life that justice isn't always served to those who deserve it yeah. in the right way and sometimes those unfortunately who don't deserve the sentences they receive or like they they receive sentences they don't deserve I guess is the right way to say that are punished greatly for the actions of others and sometimes it can take a long time to clear people's names and so this is just a reality of the darkness of this movie and one thing that I thought about, and I'm curious what you guys think about this. So this hold that Pennywise had on the town, right? This spell, essentially, where people weren't noticing as terrible that kids were going missing. He put up signs, but this wasn't on the national scale type thing. Like, why Why would people still live there in my mind? What type of, like, spell was over this town that caused them just to be like, well, it's pretty normal for kids to go missing. I guess we'll stay here. Well, people, people do that all the time with, like... Um traffic like people die in cars every day all day and it's been it's been whittled down to a traffic incident they don't when you watch the news they don't tell you about everybody dying in a car every day they tell you there's a backup on Mm i-15 there's a backup on 215 you know so when when it happens too much it just turns into like a statistic at that um, point, you know, yeah. just like tornado alley. People still live in tornado alley at this, you know, it's yeah. just one of those things. It's like, okay, I, I guess this is what life's going to be, you know, which is sad. And, and you'd think everybody would move out of town, but maybe Pennywise veiled everybody from the real problems. You know, one thing, if you survived it the first time, it's not going to happen to me, not going to happen to my kid. Maybe, I don't know. That's just a question I had throughout both movies is why? Why are they still there? But like you said. I just I, I really think that's what it is. I think Pennywise has the ability to blind the adults to what they don't want to see or make them forget. Or, I mean, in It Chapter 1 again, there's the scene where Ben is up against the wall getting his stomach slid open by Henry, and yeah. that old couple drives by and watches it happening and just has no reaction and keeps driving by and then that red balloon kind of comes up yeah and that kind of shows like pennywise is manipulating everything was, was pennywise the people in the car we should go back home and check that out i like, don't think he was i no? think he just had some sort of control to make the adults see what he wanted them to see or not see you yeah know? um with that with the town with him having power over people mike has gone crazy yeah, he's him. Yeah, he's lo- he's lost it. He's stayed in the town and he's losing his mind because of it. So that could be a thing, you know. Staying in the town is just like either you're blind to it or you lose your mind. Well, and the thing is, is he remembers though all the terrible events that have happened. He's doing all this research, right? And this is why he gets the losers back together because he has a hypothesis on what can stop Pennywise, and it's this little like. Wicker, that's no, not wicker basket, it's but a it's, basket. A, it's a leather basket, yeah. right? And 
that he stole from a Native American <laughs> tribe who gave him some psych- kind of psychedelics that made him see Pennywise's origin story. Yeah. Which is really cool because in the book, it was actually the hut that they fall into when they go to find Stanley's token. Um, in the book, when they were kids, they hotbox inside that. Mm-hmm. They, they start a fire in there and it just fills with smoke and they just have this group what? trip, trip? Yeah. yeah, where they see his origin. <laughs> so in this one, they decide to make it more... Oh, well, he yeah. drugged Bill. He I straight mean, up drugged yeah, Bill. Yeah, I don't know if that's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, I don't know. I just found this way more, I don't want to say believable, but in a way, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. It worked for me. Okay, yeah. 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 If, you, if you've if you done psychedelics or have experienced you know, psychedelics from what I've read, I read Michael Pollan's book. He has a really interesting book on doing psychedelics, by the way. Kind of opens your mind. I don't know. I just, yeah. I, I don't understand how all that works and so i didn't get that if you have too much smoke it could give you a trip i had no idea that if you burn the trees and just sat in there it would do it but i i've heard lots of stories i've seen stranger things of what acid can do to you you know it depends on what kind of trees <laughs> it they opens are your mind <laughs> um no but essentially like with this basket right and when he drugs his buddy he sees everything right you said the origin story but what's kind of crazy too is Mike lured them in with the half truth. Yeah, that's... he didn't give them the whole story. What did you guys think once you figured that out? So this is later in the movie where I don't know. We actually, I'm not going to skip to this yet because we need to talk about the journey a little bit more. Have we talked about that enough? Where they broke off and going and getting all well, their things, or do you guys feel like there's more to cover in that space? I have one thing to, to cover in that space. Um, with you saying, with them trying to find all their tokens and stuff. There was that really, really beautiful scene when they were all in their fort and they had to go together to find Stanley's with the shower caps. That was great. That was amazing. And that was they. This movie, like it's like we said before, like we all like it, but there are problems with it. But there are like shining moments, and it's up and down. It's like a roller coaster. Like that is a great. And you think you think the movie's going to be more like that, and then it doesn't. And then it hits you out of nowhere with more like Richie's storyline. And you're like, Oh, it was, it was great. Like, and then it, like lulls and then, yeah. you know, comes back again with Richie. Richie's a really good point in this movie. Like his, his character, his character arc is the glue for the movie for me. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's really good, but that's, that's all I have to say more or less on that. But well, uh, let's just kind of go. Th- oh, sorry. Did you No, but just also because, it was new content. I mean, exactly. even though it jumped back to the kids, it was new content that we'd never seen before. How we talked about they didn't have the hut in the first one, but this one they go back to it. It really was. I mean, like, I didn't cry, but I was extremely moved emotionally when they were all sitting there with the shower caps. And you were just thinking about, you know, all these kids wearing shower caps to keep spiders out of their hair, but you were moved emotionally because of what happened with their friend and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. I was just going to say, let's just really quick go through the different tokens that each one of them had and kind of what they had to find within themselves and what they had to find to use. So um, Mike tells them that they need to each go out and find a specific thing from their past and they need to perform this ritual, this Native American ritual, right? Called the ritual of Chud Chud. or Chud, Chud. the ritual of Chud which will kill Pennywise is what he's, what he's telling them. We find out later that he, he lies to him, that it's all a placebo that the Native Americans thought would work, tried to stop him before, and it didn't end up happening. But then they all go out and they kind of find their, their different items. So do you guys remember which, what each ones were? So Bill's was Georgie's boat. little boat that he oh. created. Actually, really quickly as we're kind of talking about this, this trip or experience of Bill going out and getting like – Georgie's thing that was pretty jarring to me that whole experience and like him going you know and having the experience where he wants to protect the kid he wants you know to make things right with what he couldn't do with his brother and then you find out that on that day Bill fake sick like he didn't want to go play in the rain one time and he's held this regret in his pit of his stomach right for his whole entire life and what's crazy is is he finds himself down in the water you know hoisting Georgie's little puppeteered mannequin body up he like became pennywise yeah. yeah he became pennywise, pennywise at that point he beat himself up for, about Season. that for yeah. so long that he became his own villain yeah 
That was one of my favorite scenes of the movie. So we can transition that into, you know, Bill's journey to get the paper boat is that when he's, you know, down there and we find out this new piece of information, this one, while it was still part of sort of like the clunky, you know, hard cut storyline was also very moving. It was one of my favorite parts of the entire movie because it shows the largest, one of the largest amounts of growth for any of the characters because Bill the entire sequence of him overcoming this telling his past self that it's not his fault like just because you didn't want to play one day in the rain you're not to blame for these deaths and then him both you know in like a in a symbolic way choking out georgie under the water but then when he shoots his past self in the head it's him shooting that idea that everything was his Mm -hmm. fault because that's what he believed his entire life so even though he, he struggles with it because it's something new, because he, he stutters his way through that speech pretty pretty bad. It's It was really, really moving to me. So I, I couldn't think of a more eloquent way to say that other than I was extremely moved no, during that a, part. That's a really good way of putting it. Also in this scene, you we see Pennywise use Bill's fear probably the best way in the entire movie, the way that Pennywise uses it when they're in that house of mirrors and that's that is bill's fear is not being able he wished he could have saved his brother and he couldn't save that little boy Mm -hmm. and then on on top of that that scene where you had to you get to watch pennywise lick the glass for and like you just sit there and watch it and then he takes a bite out of that kid takes just yeah he takes the bite out of the kid he kills the kid right in front of bill and makes him relive his like Bill thinks he can overcome his fear with this, like save the boy. And so he can not feel bad about letting Georgie go and he can't. And that's Pennywise at his best. Mm-hmm. And Bill did get back his pretty freaking sweet bike with a freaking, what do you call that? Guest Cameo appearance Cameo. by Stephen King himself. And the best part was that Stephen King made fun of himself in that line right there because in this movie, actually, and this is something we haven't talked about yet, Bill is a writer, right? And he is ridiculed for never having good endings to his uh, stories and books. Guess who else is ridiculed for not having good story endings to their books? The writer, Stephen King. So that was pretty cool. And, man, I wish that I had that bike. I personally want to find a bike like that and rip around because <laughs> he la- that was a freaking rust bucket, and he was just zooming. Yo, and when he pulled up to the fair, he did the little, like, oh, the, the back pedal. The back pedal Ooh. so that he could skirt and, like, stop right yeah, there. That, that was, was cool. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in the books, Stephen King goes on for pages describing that bike. Like, it is a big deal in the book. And so it was really nice that it actually had its moment in this one. In the first movie, you hear you see them riding their bikes through a window, and you hear um, Bill say, like, hi-ho, silver away! But that's, like, all you get of the... Of the I mean, other than seeing it, that's the only, like, time it points it out, the bike. And so it was really cool to have that moment of just being, like, something that was so important that he spent pages describing this thing and his love for this bike that you got to and actually see the bike. he got to be there with the bike. Yeah. Um, in the uh, original... 1990s they use the bike they they melt the bike down into oh. like pieces and use it as slingshot as a silver kill. bullets yeah like silver bullets because they think his yeah like a werewolf situation yeah yeah so i thought yeah that was a really cool homage to the bicycle <laughs> that's really cool all right so bill gets georgie's boat um, beverly goes back and grabs the postcard yep beverly goes back home and we talked about her <laughs> crazy experience in her home with this old lady. You guys with, want to talk about with that, that. Yeah. Well, not the scene specifically after the scene. Uh, I haven't read the book, but I did notice that the old man, so it transitions from her old place into a really old building. She's running down the hall and then she goes to turn around and there's this old man, which ends up being Bill Skarsgård. Oh yeah. Place. yeah. So him without his makeup. And that is a really I, I've heard that's a really big point in the book. Do you want to yeah, tell us more about I, that? I can't remember it well enough. His name's something gray, mm-hmm. and I, I can't remember the details of it, though. Uh, I, I wish I... That was a it. freaky thing, though. It's like when he's just like... Oh, and then kind like, of tears his face off. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's underneath the face is the makeup. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how that's, so good. That was cool. See, that's the kind of stuff that's creepy. I want more of that, less of the CGI monster jumping at you. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we've you want to be that. You want to be stuck in the scene where you're forced... 
to watch this. You're forced to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like the, the opening scene that was, you had to sit through this and that is like, that's the horror that I'm looking for. Yeah. And that's what I thought this was going to be with that. The face ripping scene was, was great. Do you know yeah. what I thought was interesting about that scene actually, is I thought about this, I was like, the monsters are in me, the monsters are inside of us. And it's like what you intake, right? Like now I'm getting all like Zen over here. Right. But <laughs> it's like what you take in is like what you become. So what happened to this guy where the monster like was able to consume his like spirit, if you will, or his internal, being and then you're ripping off your own flesh and there is pennywise beneath always yeah. and it's like people people become crazy and that's i i want to know a pennywise like real like deep pennywise origin story like why is he a dancing clown what's going on here why um, is he this deadlights this what? is all a rumor this is a very big rumor right now the uh director of the movie was talking to bill skarsgård and I think it's Collider.com tweeted out that they are discussing a P Pennywise prequel happening thousands and thousands of years before this one. Very much a rumor, very much all speculation. Who knows if it this actually is, happens? I don't know. This I, is where Hollywood takes, yeah. takes it too far for horror. Because we all want to know, yeah. but we don't actually want to know. Yeah. That's a good part. Because <laughs> when we know, we're like, that was stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's where it takes the fear away. right? Well, it's like, like fear is yeah. the unknown. And if you explain it all away, what are you going to do? If that's yeah. fair enough, because now it's like, it's still a mystery to me, but yeah, sorry for my so little, we'll, we'll, we'll see what there. happens in the next few years. If that actually gets announced or not, or if that's just them, like, look at all this money we have. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, spend, let's <laughs> spend more on that than it chapter two itself. <laughs> yeah. This whole movie CGI. <laughs> you guys are going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then really quick, so yeah. not to like jump too far off of that, but with Beverly getting the note and everything, it sort of shows you how much they've forgotten and makes you feel so bad for Ben when she oh, goes yeah. back and she's like, oh my gosh, I remember how he made me feel and stuff and Ben's just sitting there like, yeah, like I nailed it. And then he's like, Bill. And mm -hmm. you're just like, no! no. And that, that reminds me again of the Chinese restaurant scene when, when Bill and Beverly are talking and if you look over their shoulder, you just see Bill watching them talking and you just see like the jealousy in his face through their entire dialogue that they have with each other. He just wants to be there. He wants to be Bill in that moment. And it's just yeah. so, it's one of those little things that, you know, don't stand out. That's just a nice little touch <laughs> to the whole thing. You know? And just in case we never get back to it, I just like, yay, Ben gets the girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When Good that bed. when that Bill scene, when she says Bill, you can hear the whole theater collectively's heartbreak. And She's then like, at oh, the yeah. end, when she kiss, they kiss, and, and it like men's, you can hear everybody yeah. men. You're like, yes. yes. <laughs> the fat kid gets the girl finally. January I can embers. relate to that real well. Oh, back to Jam January Embers. The scene when Ben is yeah. Let's in, talk about Ben's yeah, token. You, you no, jump you into it. Sorry. So Ben's token is the note the yearbook page that Beverly signed and the way he has to get it, he ends up back in the classroom and Beverly's there and, and there he goes in to kiss her. Cause there's a moment that he thinks he can, can kiss her. And she leans back and says, Oh my gosh, do you, you think I would actually kiss you? You fat, like disgusting per man, like boy. And, and Another that was heartbreaking moment, heartbreaking moment. Just like, Oh, okay, that hurt. And then, like, the scene cut, and she, he looks away, and he looks back, and her whole head's on fire. That was scary. Yeah. That was really scary. That was cool. One. The intensity in her eyes and, like, the way the flames look, that was that was unsettling. So Ghost guess, Rider meets Pennywise. <laughs> so I guess as we look back about it, and we'll keep on going with each one of their individual tokens, for at least most of them, the scenes themselves were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Just in an overall sense transition as well as this was like, what, like an hour of yeah. movie time mm -hmm. that was just all of this. So they're individually cool. But yeah. yeah. And everybody got their story, but like you said, it was so formula formula. Formulaic. Thank you. Yeah. It was like build up scare, like conclusion to the scare joke. Yeah. Um, so Ben ends up getting the yearbook as his token, right? The yearbook page that Beverly the signed. The one page, yeah. The one person that signed his book the moment that he fell in love with her when he was a kid. Which is weird because wasn't he carrying around his wallet the whole time, though? Yeah. yeah. And so he has to re-experience all of that horror, and he had it the whole time. Dang well, it. Well, because I think he goes back there, I don't know, trying to 
in search of something else. I don't know if he knew it would be the yearbook page, but then when he goes into the locker, he's he like finds it. Like I don't know, like how it got out, Had but he like finds away. it and he knows. Oh. That was one part though. That was just like a roll your eyes jump scare because you yeah, knew in it was the locker. in the locker because you could tell exactly the from the, the angle. Was... You're like it's gonna pan. That, he's gonna be right there. <laughs> and that poster too that was like eyeing the camera i yeah. think it was one of the i can't remember what, yeah. what poster it was but yeah you new knew kids it was on the happen. block poster i think so well and then we go into richie's freaking paul bunyan that was scary. giant that that tripped me out because i love those paul bunyan statues i go out of my way to find those <laughs> random fact about me i love those things but man oh man i that one got me actually because it was the old lady in that one that got me the most and dude it was a good one, and now it's pulled directly from the book too. Mm-hmm. And when I watched the first one, that's one of the moments that put a big smile on my face because I knew what goes on with that statue. And then they never did it, and I was like, okay, that's, at least it was an Easter egg in there. So I was really happy that they added this into it. And um, looking more into it, it was one of the only scenes that Stephen King requested from the director. He add into the, add into this movie, and so the director was like, oh yeah, for sure. If you want Stephen King, we'll do it for you. Quick Stephen question. King had a lot more say in this movie than he did the first one quick question for you guys just from talking to other people i guess that a lot of people even after the scene in the arcade and him running out to the fence some people still didn't you know understand what they were doing with richie's sexuality and so this part when pennywise is talking to him and he's like oh you're a big secret and all that stuff like did you guys were you guys aware mm-hmm. at this part of yeah, what was going at on at the end i was like okay well that's what that meant um apparently there's been speculation for years about the novel because it's never said about richie and eddie and this kind of cemented it, cemented it yeah so okay it, i just yeah, wanted to see like, if it was like something that was really like less known because both my wife, not until like the very end, and then a couple of other people I talked to, they were like, "Oh yeah, like." And when you find out at the end all the stuff about him, I think being it, gay and stuff is like, wait, that was like what it was hinting at the whole time. That was sort of like his fear. You know? I think it was about this moment that I realized what they were doing with it, and that made me expect it to come out over and over again throughout the movie. And I thought they just handled it really well. Where, kind of like with the book, it wasn't something that was like in your face, you know? It was just subtly in the background. And they did like give you the answer by the end of it. I mean, they didn't really. They just saw the E. But by, you know, Richie's reaction at the end, just like breaking apart after Eddie dies, that scene where they just start crying, he just starts crying, breaks down in the pond, and they all come over and hug him. Such a strong, strong scene, you know? That was a powerful. Yeah. That was a it, powerful so scene. So well handled. That was one of the best. It just and so where well handled. Richie was quiet. He was quiet, which was for the really, first time. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. And that's when he breaks down. Like everybody looks at him, he just doesn't say anything. Oh man, God, I'm, so you're good. not tearing up. <laughs> Shut. <laughs> All right. So and then Richie ends up getting the token from the arcade. Mm-hmm. That was his right. And so last we have. Oh no, we still have Mike. Um who he doesn't really we don't really explore his thing but he ends up bringing the rock from the rock fight in the original movie oh that has blood on it still from From, henry mm -hmm. right which was his moment where he joined the losers club became found his place in the the team so it means a lot to him but you don't really get to explore much other than that i guess we explored it from the first one so you don't really need to and then last is eddie's when he goes back into the old pharmacy where he used to go get his medication all the time and the same people are still working there 27 the years later batter. and they have just gotten worse they just both look terrible <laughs> so bad. the keens keens market is what it's called oh and man he just looks bad and he has that whole sequence down in the basement that creepy where his mom's all tied up and the lepers there again did you guys like that this time around well that was that one of the out. final ones this was where you were sort of okay we know what's going on it's starting to be a drag and it was too for me it was too much like the first one with the leper and everything and they were sort of like going for a gross factor like when he squishes the eye and and when it pukes on him the music the music cue when he yeah that was weird that was yeah it didn't fit for me it it felt like what they it felt like they were trying to do what they did with the rock fight in the first one 
where it all of a sudden breaks out into like music and it, like the it feels different and it's fun and it's exciting. And oh it's no, like, yeah, I forgot about that. That was so weird. Yeah, and yeah. it goes into that. You That's... are my angel. You're my yeah. darling. And he's like puking all over him, and, and all of a sudden cuts again. It's like <laughs> yeah, either go for it or don't go exactly. for it. Exactly. That's like where that's those are the things that the comedy the the yeah. wrong timing mm-hmm. is like the best way to put it. There's so much good comedy in this one that when there's really bad comedy, you're just like, what yeah. is happening? You really feel that bad comedy. Uh, no, because so- even though we talk so much about Richie's comedy, Eddie for a lot of the movie really does have comedic points as well because they go back and forth and most, most of the banter and smart jokes come from Richie's side. But then sometimes, I mean, not to like throw to the end or give it away, but when he's dying and he's like, Richie, what? I begged your mom, like, as yeah. he's dying. <laughs> oh, sorry, anyways. No, and so Eddie ends up getting the uh, the inhaler for his token, yeah. and then they head down into the sewer. Dude, going back to the house, that was, there was, was that so one creepy, yeah, creepy part with the damn spider head. Oh, oh that I was love great. that. That was where the CGI worked. Yes. Yeah, yeah no, that, that was worked good. Small, very well. Real small. That was but on was, my list of favorite parts of the movie because it freaked me out. Like I hated it so much that I loved it because that I already have a sphere of spiders and seeing that with like the head, that was some freaky deaky crap. Have right you there. seen the thing? Yeah, the that thing? was totally. And then yeah. he says the line, mm-hmm. you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, no, it's a direct get... reference reference to the 1980s thing. You should definitely check that out. It's, it's so good. Practical effects. That movie is the best um example of practical effects everything done in that movie is real life built and and made and it's just a direct callback to that and it's so cool and that entire haunted house sequence this is where it gets fun again you know like you're going through that roller coaster of emotions and then from here until the end it's it's intense and it's good jump scares and it's a lot of fun and you get down into the sewer and sorry go ahead for most of it oh there's there's some parts that i you know, rolled my eyes at during this part. One part that I loved was right before the spider scene when like the fridge is shaking and opens up and you see his head. It's like the callback to the first one when it's shaking and opens up and Pennywise is in there all contorted. So that's sort of what I'm expecting to see. But then it, you see the body all contorted and you're like, okay. And then you see Stanley. And so it takes yeah. you, you know, off guard. And then when they go back up to the doors, it's like so iconic from the first one. And like part of it was like really funny and crazy to the dog part I just like, <laughs> like, like, oh. like the dog I like the dog <laughs> I like, I thought, that was too. great I thought it was funny that I just like, like that's when the comedy got was good for me was the dog because it was like a little bit long it wasn't just like a joke and then run off but like the dog was great the dog was great and then when they're running off they're like well, just pick the regular scary <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was funny though I did like, and I mean like it wasn't that it was unfunny I was just like okay yeah. like this dog's obviously like about to like go crazy yeah, so, I but thought it was, was good. I thought it was gonna be like the dog guy from like Rick and Morty, where he like breaks off a tooth and comes <laughs> up like, oh, squanch. <laughs> no, but no, that's kind of crazy. It felt it felt really surreal. I think that's the right word to use. Going back to the house, right, and then them getting back down there, and kind of like the water is deeper this time. Like there, the the portal down or the way to go down the hatch is like this floating where Pennywise's little carriage was before and all the bikes and bodies were floating and they go down. It's not just like right there. It's not like a, it's like a, Oh, here we are. We're back down. It is a journey to get down there and you get down there and it's not what you expect. And I think that this was probably one of the most well shot moments of the film. I think is when they get in this room and it spins and there's this, these shards spike things going up and you're like, this was great. Just like I mentioned in the first one where they get to that one room and everything's floating and it's beautiful. I saw that shot and I was like, I thought exactly about what I said before. And I was like, man, like maybe I'm a weird like person or I've got a weird sense of, no. you know, whatever. But it was beautiful. That, it was a gorgeous shot of that, that room where all of the final action takes place. That whole set is so cool. How it has like, so in their fever dream, in their drug dream, they, they see the meteor coming down and hit the earth. And so you expect to find, like, it's a crater where it landed, but you don't see, like, a big rock in the ground or anything. It's just the shards that go up that look like it hit and froze into place. And that's when you realize that the monster, Pennywise, it is more than just this shape-shifting thing. And you see the deadlights come down. And he is basically, I mean, he's the deadlights, but he is basically that entire room. 
<laughs> like the ceiling opens up and he floats out of the sky and th- through like teeth in this tunnel of just scary cool i don't know i loved it i loved this entire part well i loved the entire set piece yeah the giant clown monster so that do you remember the first the the spider 90s? yeah it was the yeah. spider i think they tried to fix the problems of the 90 like 1990 version where it was not just a spider because it was confusing and nobody knew what was going on so they kind of kept half Pennywise, half, half spider. spider. I don't know if it didn't work for me, but it wasn't like out of nowhere just a spider. Like, where's Pennywise? We've been seeing this clown this whole time, and then all yeah. of a sudden it's a spider. Like, it yeah. kind of tried. I, I, look, I try to look past the spider clown, and at, <laughs> and I look at the spider deadlights. Spider clown, <laughs> spider clown, <laughs> coming well, because, around the whole dang town. I mean, like maybe it's just because I, I've never seen the original one, but I, oh, yeah. I when I saw this guy, when I saw him turn into like this like crab like clown thing, my immediate thought, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, turned to Wreck It Ralph. Have you guys seen Wreck It Ralph? Yeah, but not yeah, for a long I just time. Don't remember. So, like, at the very end, like, spoilers for Wreck-It Ralph. Like, skip ahead 30 seconds if you haven't watched it. Like, the King Candy guy, he turns into Turbo, and he turns... He eats one of those, like, bug things. And so he turns into, like, this giant, like, <laughs> flying, like, insect with legs. But he looks pretty much like a clown because he's got a big nose and stuff. Oh, and so I was oh. like, boom, Wreck-It Ralph. Yeah. And so it was... I think for other reasons as well, but it was also kind of hard to take him seriously. But then he started going crazy, you know? Yeah. So it wasn't and, that bad. And we have to throw out, too, that the, the ritual of Chad doesn't work. Um, Mike, like you said, lied to him, and it was a placebo, and so they have to figure out how to stop this giant spider clown. Um, <laughs> you got to stop I, saying spider I want, clown. I want to shout out, though, the deadlights, how they did that when when he uses the deadlights against, I think it's Richie, and yeah. freezes him in the air, and it shows like his mouth open up like in the first one. But this time you see it not from looking through Pennywise's mouth, but you see it from the, like, the back or the side. And you can see that the deadlights are shining through his physical body down through the mouth to him. I, I thought that was a really, really cool shot. Damn. And that's where we get my favorite part of the entire movie. Casey will cue up the, you know, the beat part of it. But when Eddie finally overcomes his fear, <laughs> beep, beep, mother <laughs> <laughs> I loved that. But we can, so I love it's this. Gonna, it's going to sound like beep, beep. You're going to say beep, beep, and it's going to go beep, 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 It's Morse code, guys. That's what happened to this film. No, but I love that part. It was so good. I, even though it was in like a big action sequence, I love that part. Just Eddie, you know, overcoming, doing what he wants to, but also making it super funny. Because I love that they brought that back from the first one. Because not even just there, because he's like, you know, beep, beep is what they say to make Richie shut up, right? And so the thing just keeps talking, and so he wants him to stop, and he wants him to let go of Richie, so he says beep, beep, you know? Yeah. And... Uh, so even earlier when they're up in the house and Richie's all nervous and he's talking like uh, Beth says it right yeah, yeah Beth says it she's like beep beep Richie <laughs> and it's like yeah. take a chill pill um, but can we talk a little about I love this final scene and we like we talked about the middle a little bit of the movie lulled but I loved this final scene with all of them having to confront their f- their fears as adults which transitioned from them as kids and it did it in a lot better way I think than the whole middle part of the movie because specifically for me, at least with Ben, the whole, I mean, cause you had Ben and Bev and they were sort of mirroring each other in different ways, but it, it was yeah, one of the cool. most like big parts where no matter what you think you've done now that we've brought you back to this town, you see that you like are where you always thought you were. And no matter how many pull-ups or setups you can do, you're going to die like a fat kid alone, you know? Yeah. And so that's just as, as one of the things I love this entire final part, because like we talked about earlier, the whole part with Bill where he had to overcome his past self and his, his fear of not being enough and him taking responsibility for, um, Georgie, Georgie's death. My bad. Yeah. No. Um, and this kind of, as we're wrapping down, um, I think this is the perfect place to bring it up. Remember last week we talked about like what, what would Pennywise do to us to scare us? as adults or to scare an adult or whatever the the whole movie explores this idea and it it's past trauma like 
Pennywise will scare adults through past trauma, and he uses this throughout the entire movie and this whole end sequence that you're talking about where he uses all the characters' past traumas against them. He cuts um, cuts up Ben's stomach at one point while they're in the mansion, you know? the uh, We talked about how Ben is scared of being alone, and so he tries to bury him. Bev is scared of... She has all this past trauma with the men in her life, so she's stuck in this stall with all these men trying to, like get into her and abuse her each one of them has to relive their past trauma and sorry not to intercut just that was one of the most beautiful and one of the most symbolic parts of the movie is that they helped each other overcome their fears with that he had the fear of being the fat kid alone she had Mm -hmm. the fear of all the men in her life and when they break out and they grab hands it's like a really slow like and they grab hands that's a symbolic of both of them overcoming it at the same yeah. time because he's not alone anymore because he's got Bev and she doesn't have an abusive partner anymore. Yeah. That's so cool. And I don't know, it's just everything was, you look past all the corny CGI, you look past all the, all that kind of stuff and you kind of try to find the themes that you can hold on to that really work for you. And that's, that's what kind of stood out to me the most is like friendship and building each other up and kind of getting over what's hurt you the most together finding that person that can help you and that kind of like leads us really to the end of the movie to be honest you know i'm I'm not trying to close everything out in a real big flash but think about like stanley's contribution to this whole over the whole umbrella of the experience right they are back home and they get these letters from stanley's wife and essentially it's stanley outlining why he did what he did why he took his life josh do you kind of want to touch on that a little bit this is like the most subtle crazy twist that like i've ever seen in a movie because if you think about it it's not a twist that changes the storyline it just sort of changes almost like a Shyamalan film that changes how you view the storyline in a really subtle way because you think about it and you think about it that he said he said i did this because i knew that if we were all there together that there would be nothing to risk there'd be no real reason to keep going and that we'd all pack up and leave and we wouldn't destroy it. So Stanley, even though we thought that he killed himself at the beginning because of his fear, which is possibly true, he also does it to sort of give them a push. And if you think about it, like after I was leaving the theater and I thought back about, thought back about it, I was like, that's really true because like at, at various times throughout the movie, You know, Richie or other people, they're like, all right, I'm packing up and leaving. And what eventually always convinces them to keep going is, like, guys like Stan died, like, for this. And it's just going to keep happening to other people if we don't put a stop to it. And, like, while that might not be, like, I see, like, I see Vince, like, wincing over here. I I didn't like this at all. Oh, my gosh. Vince, how could you... And I'm also, <laughs> sorry, I'll finish up my thought really quick and then, we'll, and then we'll jump over to Vince. I'm like a sucker for like a cute like voiceover, like with a cool thing to like wrap up a movie. Like I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. Like the end of Stranger Things 3, like I bawled because like the whole like voiceover thing and everything like that. I just like went crazy for, I go crazy for that kind of stuff. And so this, like him saying, outline saying why he did this and it sort of giving it a different meaning saying, hey, yeah, like that's true. Like, it's kind of like, I do agree, like, you think about it, I'm like, oh, like, he didn't just want to, like, try to provide motivation, like, he went so far as to kill himself, but it provides a different light on the way you see it. Anyways. Yeah, and and I see what they were trying to do there, Um, but I don't know, my initial response was, it, that's not how it happened in the book, Stanley was just so scared by, and traumatized by his past that he couldn't handle it, and, and so he just had to find a way to get away from it you know and so that's why i initially didn't have didn't like it but then i listened to this podcast this afternoon and she was talking about how it's kind of i don't i don't really know if i want to get into it or how deep i want to get into it but it kind of like glorified suicide as a way to i don't know protect their family i don't know i just i don't believe that suicide is a way out no matter what he should have found a way to kind of help and i see what they're trying to do like when they were talking about it but then also just like if if that was the fact she brought up like they brought up the idea of like if he was doing it to help his friends why did he kill himself in such a gruesome way for his wife to come in and be traumatized and live all leave all the people that love him now in his life 27 years later 
in a way, you know, I don't know. It just, it didn't work for and me. That's, I just didn't like it. I understand that extremely as well, because even though I was like, oh, like this is what happened and it provided a new way to look at it, which yeah. is why it got me like story-wise. When you think about it like that and stuff like that, something that I completely agree with what you said, especially about glorifying suicide and all that other stuff is that that's always a no-go. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard topic to yeah to get sure. into and... And actually, this month is Suicide Prevention Month. I'm going to be real honest with you. So if you really need to talk to someone, you should probably go talk to someone because it's it's really like people are here for you and it's not really an end of something. And I really feel like I should throw that in right there because this is a really hard subject to talk about. But I'm more in the agreements of the mindset of like, I thought that this was a really good way to showcase that there are some people who take actions that they don't necessarily know the outcomes of like so for the classic film right it was primarily and fully done out of film out of fear and that's why stanley took his life and in this one he brings up the idea that with him coming they would be divided and that's what would cause them to fall to pennywise right and so they wouldn't be able to complete anything at all and that's that's kind of a sad way to look at oneself really is like if i'm there i'm the weak link and i'm what's going to cause everything to tremble and i would never personally like, I, I have my own struggles, right? But I never like to feel like I'm the weakest member of a, any party and, like, I'm the link that could break something apart. And so that's kind of, in reality, like, I don't necessarily feel like a lot of people, you know, it's 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 a touchy thing. I felt that it was a good way of putting it. Like, you need to be united in a lot of things, and especially where we are in a time of such divisive nature with politics, news, religion, sex, and all of this type of stuff that's going on. This was a good way to, like, try to, like, remind people to be united with groups of like-minded people and people who can achieve things but i thought that it was a solid way to end a movie not the ideal way obviously to glorify a situation right like that and i don't think that's what they were trying to do i don't think they were trying to glorify it i think that's just one way someone can read it you know this 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 is art you know like one people one person can look at it one way and see him as a hero and one person can look at him as another way and see him as I don't want to say a villain, but see it in a different light, you know? Yeah. And and that's just True. how it is. And and it's fine. It didn't ruin the movie for me. I saw exactly what they were going for. I just didn't like it. And if it was me that made the movie, I wouldn't have chosen that direction. But it's not my movie, so I respect his decision. And I see what he was doing with it. And I, it's fine. Like, I'll, it's fine. I'll get over it and move on. Yeah, well, that kind of stuff, you start noticing those little tidbits of movies that you don't like when the movie isn't as good as you want it to be so you start tearing it apart little little bit by little bit like if the movie had been better i don't think we would have looked at it and been like uh it's kind of glorifying suicide i think we've just been like oh yeah that was great you know but by by the time for me by the time i'd gotten to that voiceover i was so burnt by the 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 way that they beat pennywise i was just like okay i'm done like you didn't I just, like them screaming. No, I crap. didn't like that. Them. Was such bullying. It That's was. what I felt like it was. It was just bullying. I felt like I was at a, <laughs> everyone was, it like was. chanting, "You yeah. suck, yeah. you I suck." I literally you smell ugly nose. I literally leaned over to my wife and I was like, "So the moral of the story is yep. bully people to get what you want. <laughs> yeah, bully people, you get what you want, and kill yourself to help the crew." Like I, I, I okay, I wrapped it up weird. Yeah, it was. But I mean, but this is Stephen back, King. That's what I was gonna say. Comes back to that meta joke throughout the whole thing you know like Stephen King or Stephen King's books never end well yeah yeah that was great still an amazing movie and I liked it I did not like it as much as I liked the first one um the book is still the best of the three of course (laughs) but man I love number one so so much and I feel like this one is just it's good it's just shy as being as good as the original and like I said, I feel like you could watch either of them and it could be a standalone movie. So if I never want to watch this one again, which I will watch this one again because I liked it that much, this is a movie that I will repeat view. But I I still have the original that I can watch over and over and over and over and over and over because I love that movie so much. They're both elite horror films for me. I would say that personally I liked the second one more than the first one. It had like... For me, it just had like sort of like a more like epic vibe while it did have more like fundamental flaws... I just loved, like, I love that they dived a little bit into deeper themes as well as it being, like, a more epic movie. Not just an action, just sort of, I don't know how to describe it, the overall feel of it. So 
they're both like super top tier horror for me i would say uh this one nudged out the first one and i loved it and if you haven't already but some for some reason checked out this whole podcast check it out <laughs> or if you've already watched it you know check it out again yeah no the uh the first one is great the second one is subpar for me it just i don't think i might watch it again just to see if i can like like see if i can see anything that i missed the first time to to get more character building and more character arcs but i don't think i'll ever come back to it other than the the one time i enjoyed it and i will probably watch it again to be honest with you but i enjoyed the first movie better and i can go back to the classic made for tv film and thoroughly enjoy myself there too my actual commitment and this is a real commitment not joking on your dark crystal like trying to be funny in a way but no i'm really gonna watch it this week just so you know but but I'm actually like hoping to read the book. Like I, I have a friend who has a copy and he's brought to work and is sitting on my desk. So I'm planning on reading it in the next month just to kind of see, cause everyone else has told me about reading the book. So I want to read it and have that experience. That other people like Vince have We're like, well, this is the book and this is why I like the book and it's the better of the, the one. But for me right now, I would go like, honestly, like the first movie it chapter one, I would go the made for TV and then I'd go, this is my third favorite. Like, honestly. And it's just because like, I'm as a kid that like, it was like the scariest thing for me. I remember like that movie, like it wasn't like horrifying. Right. But it really, it was a like, classic childhood thing where people would wear it. Like they clowning your shirt. You'd be like, that's freaking sketch, man. But no, I think that overall, like this movie, like if I were to give it a rating for me, like I said, I'm not going to go back to it as much. It's probably, I'll watch it again. Right. But like for me, it's a, it's probably a, a high six point something. It's not a seven. Cause that's just a safe bet. Right. It's a six point something for me. It's not, it's not the greatest, but it's not the worst I've ever seen. Anyone else have anything to touch on before we go? 8.4. Sorry. I was oh. just thinking about how I'd rate it. 8.4. What 8.4. about you? Number right off the top of your head, Michael. Six. Six. Who? Oh. I'm on Letterbox and they do it out of five stars. Uh, what would a three and a half be? <laughs> it's like a seven, seven, seven and a half. I gave it a three and a half on there. So three and a half out of five would be seven. Yeah. yeah. I gave the first one a five. Whoa. I love the first one so much. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Well, the thing is that you see that even if, you know, we're over about what could be good or what could be not as good, it's at least a solid film. And I mean, while there could have been better things, I think it was a solid way to wrap up everything that wasn't in the first and at least, you know, make it a good you know, little two-story thing. Yeah. yeah. I still have stuff that I want to talk about, so maybe we're going to have to do a bonus episode later this week just of, like, <laughs> fun facts and Easter eggs and that kind of stuff, just like a 20-minute thing, like kind of like we do with Spider-Man. So, you know, check in a cup, you know, end of the week or something like that. We'll probably have something up. Yeah, for sure. Any Any last words aside from that? Nope. Just be sure to check us out. Um, we're doing a lot on Twitter recently. Both me and Casey are on there. So hop on and talk with us at Pods Rewind PLA on Twitter. Also, my picture from Halloween, the year it came out, is <laughs> on our Twitter account. It might even go up on our Instagram account. Yeah. But yeah, I up. dressed up as the character I was born to be, guys, Georgie. And please check it out. I want you guys to know. It's the only costume I've really ever felt the real part of. It's so, so cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it on Instagram when this uh, episode drops. So if you haven't seen it already before you saw this, jump over to our, or listen to this, jump over to our Instagram. You can check it out there. You'll love it. And also, guys, something that's kind of exciting coming down the pipeline as well, we're actually going to launch the Pause Rewind Play website, which is actually going to have show notes. I'm going to launch the first one with the release of this. I'm not going to give you guys the website yet. I might throw a link of it on either the Twitter or just the Instagram, just kind of see what it's going. But we're going to start having show notes, which will also kind of give you a little bit more in-depth look at a few things. So kind of check that out. And thank you so much, as always, for your support and listening to us. Give us ratings where you can, especially on Apple Podcasts. We're trying to grow an audience, obviously, and we want to be able to continue to do these and know that you know people are hearing us and we're doing a good job. Obviously, we want feedback and stuff. So please provide us with that. And then finally, we want to thank Michael for coming back on. He's been with us on so many shows and i hope he keeps coming because i enjoy it it's great it's so much fun thank you guys for always having me and having a blast i love it and, and oh sorry and trust us definitely with 
Michael, he's been our go-to, especially with all of our horror movies that we've been doing. And right now, as we're approaching, you know, October and all of those other movies that are coming out, you can be sure that we'll have Michael back with us. Oh yes, and if I think, he'll have us. I think. Yeah, I was gonna yeah, say if yeah. he'll come to my house again <laughs> after the tonight, the scare that went down down oh the street. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm gonna set up the cot and just I'll watch out the window for anybody that's coming down the street. <laughs> Never going to Macy's. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome. Well, and for our next week's full feature film, so we're going to do a bonus episode actually on it. It's official. Set in stone. Let it be written. Let it be done. And we're going to actually go into one of my favorite film series of the year that I, I've i watched one and a half times now since I bought all three movies. I'm not going to lie to you guys. But we're going to watch the first John Wick film, and we're going to review that. So get get your dog, get your guns, and get your suit on because it's going to be a damn good time. <laughs> so as per usual, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the Pause, Rewind, Play podcast, and we'll catch you next time.